Uh, I'm going to take about the next 10 minutes and give you the complete history of trying to secure the infrastructure over the past 40 years and a complete history on where we can go from here and what to look for if we are actually going to make a difference. I think it's important to start out by recognizing there's some things that are not going to change. Software is going to have vulnerabilities. There always will be uh, production software that has problems. Similarly, people, system administrations and users, people are a, a hopeful species. We click on things. We enter the lottery. We think good things will happen. And often they do, which is how businesses succeed. So users are hopeful, businesses are hopeful that they're going to see, succeed. Businesses need to take risks to succeed. The bad guys know all this. The bad guys know about the vulnerabilities in the software and the people and take advantage of them. So one of the immutables is we have to protect the infrastructure separately often from the way we run the infrastructure. So it's very hard for an infrastructure to protect itself. How many of you bought a car seat from Ford or Chevrolet? You don't buy car seats built into your car, you buy them from car seat experts. But you don't buy navigation systems and engines from somebody else and you trust safety is built into the car but you also have some things that have to be kept separate and that's, I'll show you why that's true. And how we may be able to change things a bit. So I'm going to skew a little old here if I use any terms like mainframe or Dr. Doolittle that uh, you guys are too young, it's a young looking audience, you can send us email and we'll explain those terms to you. But we first started thinking about security back in the mainframe days. We locked the computers in the basement and kept them safe. Uh, but the sysadmins made mistakes and actually I went to work at NSA right out of college in 1978 and there's an internally at the time classified, you can read it on the web now, newsletter called Cryptolog. We're in June of 78, I wrote an article about buffer overflows in software. They meant IBM mainframe operating system buffer overflows 40 years ago. And we're still dealing with them today. Client server came along not too long after, and, and we started to worry about things like uh, passwords for the user because there were smarts on the computer, and we worried about access controls in the operating system at the departmental level, yet everything went clear over the networks. And so we saw that every traffic that passed over the network could go uh, be, be attacked and be sniffed and bad things happened. We had oops there. So then we started to move towards the internet error and when we recognized we would have standard networks and TCP IP and even internet stacks built into things, even uh, Macintoshes and America Online days back in that pre-2001 time frame, and that's when we saw the rapid growth of malware and viruses attacking users, even though we thought we'd move to the next level of security. And if you remember, around 2001 or 2002 is when Bill Gates, the CEO of Windows at the time, got security religion and came out with his famous memo, Security's Job One, and he was quoted as saying, by 2003, I think we'll have this malware problem under control. That was 15 years ago. We really don't have it under control yet. We found that computers were not going to protect themselves from software since they're made of software. So sort of the next phase we went through is we had sort of the first phase of virtualization. I don't know when VMware dates it. So I remember about 2006 or so when application virtualizations first started to penetrate and data centers started to virtualize. And we heard a lot of talk about how virtualization would mean sysadmins would roll out perfect copies of executables and, and images of operating systems and there'd be no configuration control problems. Instead, we mostly found sysadmins could roll out bad copies of things faster. And we had bad processes roll out vulnerable things faster and we didn't quite change the world there. And there's a fundamental reason why we didn't make the progress, much progress over those years. And I think it comes down to this fundamental difference between the way security people and security administrators have to think of things and the way system administrators on the IT side of things have to think of things. I'd like, it's this sort of cognitive dissonance. What do you guys see in the picture here? How many see a vase? Now that I said it, everybody should. How many see two people looking at each other? Well, security people would see the vase, and you must be an IT person. You see two nice people conversing happily to each other. Uh, but security people have to think about the bad things that can happen and try to stop them. IT people have to think about meeting the demand. The systems have to keep running. The on time has to be number one. Change windows have to be small. We can't patch things all the time. So there's fundamental differences in the way a system administrator has to think about life than a security administrator. The other thing is, I worked at Gartner for almost 15 years and I think we were part of this problem, is we sort of, I call it the pet the puppy, kick the puppy problem. 
where we tell IT people your number one importance to business is digital business. IT is the most important thing. Oh, by the way, we're cutting your budget. You have to do things more cheaply and more cheaply and more cheaply. So the incentive is, is not around investment in the business in IT and in security as if it's going to make money. It's all about do things for less and less and less over time, get more efficient over time. That causes the IT side to try to do things in ways that take shortcuts, the security side to do things that simplify blocking the bad guys, but often block the good guys. So ideally, our goal is to get to unicorn land, and we've got fully secure system administrations. Our systems are as least amount of vulnerability as possible. The reality is we've mostly been stuck in this world of security and sysadmin being done totally separately, and often lots of gaps in between the two. What we'd like to get to is the Goldilocks zone, of where we're doing each side just about right, and we're cooperating in these many areas of commonality between system and security administration are being put in place at the start. So at least both the security side and the IT side are starting from a, a secure and a manageable starting place. It's a tough job. We're trying to build the, uh, the mythical push-me-pull-you, if you've ever seen your Dr. Doolittle, maybe the Eddie Murphy version, which is much newer. Um, and we're trying to get the animal's head, two heads pointed in the same direction so we can make progress. We have to be both secure enough the way we run systems and fast enough to make changes to meet the needs for business to roll out new apps. apps. We have to be able to patch things very quickly today. The bad guys exploit vulnerabilities, in, often in hours when they come out. But we still have to roll out new functionality, even if we can't wait for the patches to come out. We have to keep the systems up and running. We have to keep the users safe. I think the happiest users are safe. I'm a security person. On the other side, they think the happiest users are the ones the application always starts when they click the button very quickly. But when you start looking at the fundamental demands of these two roles, these two jobs, there's a lot of commonality. Right? If you're managing IT systems, if you're in charge of security, you want visibility, you do need to integrate to external tool sets. Not everything security people use or IT people use is baked into Windows or VMware or Google or AWS or any piece of the infrastructure, any piece of the infrastructure. We need external tools. We need an audit trail. Stuff will go wrong. We have to have a record to prove what happened, what we did, and to be able to do investigations to figure out what happened. And ideally, we're going to have baked into it change control and approval. From a security point of view, we know lack of change control introduces vulnerabilities. From an IT point of view, lack of change control builds in heterogeneity and, and, and uh, help desk problems in dealing with different configurations. But there are big areas of difference, differences for security. On the security side, we do have standard configurations. We know there's standards like the Center for Internet Security and NSA standards and DOD standards. What's secure for our Oracle database server? How should it be configured out of the box? Um, we know there's certain types of policy sets we believe certain users should adhere to. Yes, we know certain users will be able to do whatever they want, but the help desk people, the front office people, they only need to do certain things if we could enforce enforceable sets of policy on them and keep privileges separate. Similarly, the IT people have a little bit of different flavor of it. They need to have more configurations that security want. They'd like to have availability over policy. But when we start looking at how we can implement these things together, this is where sort of the new way of, wave of virtualization comes in. There's a, somebody in charge of administering at the virtualization level that can see below what the security admin and what the IT admin can see. And if they can balance at that level the security primitives and the performance primitives and put those in place that cannot be mucked with at the next level up, we have this opportunity to make major advances in security and performance at the same time. So if we can give the security people the view they need in the integration of their tools and the IT sysadmin people the view they need in the integration into their tools, and we have the virtualization layer underneath enforcing a minimal level of security and policy, then we can reach the unicorn land where we'll all be flying unicorns around to work. So I want to sort of leave you, oh, one last point is we also have to make sure as we do this that we're not building over, all, uh, over levels of complexity into the systems we build. If you want to build a better way of brushing your teeth, the Rube Goldenbergian way is building in a lot of vulnerabilities, things can go wrong. We'd like a simple thing that moves the brush back and forth for us. We don't need very complicated things. So if we can do all that, I want to leave you with an image, sort of a simplified way to think about if we're really making progress. You know, the basic problem in security, Tom alluded to this a bit, is there's a lot of stuff happening on those systems, processes, applications, things coming and going. And we have to figure out which are the legitimate business purpose ones, which should we allow to happen, which should we stop. 
We spend a lot of time in security kind of limiting the problem, trying to eliminate the ones we know are good, know are bad. In between is still a bit, pretty big problem set. If we can have that visibility from under the virtualization layer telling us nobody's ever done this before, or that application should never do what it's trying to do, we can sort of narrow the problem down to a much smaller set of applications and processes that are much more likely to not explode if we let them through, or conversely, if we stop them, less likely to cause self-inflected wounds or false positives. 